I'm Alec Hopping. Yeah, as um, Kathy said, I recently graduated from Cornell this weekend, actually, from class of 2020. We finally had it. Um, this was my undergrad thesis, uh, but also like I've been working on it for the last year and a half, um, and I'm just closing in on submission, which is pretty exciting. Uh, finally got it in. So basically, yeah, also that's me in the thing setting up what's called a Swift recorder, which I'll talk about. Um, basically the, the concept of this project, uh, well, you can see it's funded by Cornell, the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics um, and some local Peruvian NGOs, uh, Corbidi and Ida, the Incaterra Association and um, the Peruvian government. So um, this is where it takes place, um, Madre de Dios, Peru, which is basically the, the peak for alpha diversity. So the number of species um, like at a, at a single site or one location uh, on the planet. Uh, there's, there's a little bit, it gets sort of competitive in um, a couple other spots in South America, um, like Yasuni in Eastern Ecuador, and then um, on the Albertine Rift in the Ruins or Rift rather in, in East Africa. So in Uganda, you can kind of see that little bright thing. There's, but it's really a small area um, in those other sites. And Madre Dios, it's ridiculously good and like, like ridiculously, you can see that even even the really good parts of the U.S., like coastal California, southeast Arizona, Texas coast, Florida, um, are really dim compared to to that area. So it's 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 really absurd how birdy it is. Uh, it's like like Ecuador, for example, or like Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, any of those countries. Um, they all have more bird species than all of North America and Europe combined, which is crazy. And I don't think that people really realize how absurd that is like the size of Colorado has more bird species than the entire like two whole continents so um, the context is that while those areas are extremely biodiverse really important for climate stability really important for um, finding medicines for pretty much it's basically the source code for the whole planet kind of runs the show um, they're under really intense land use pressure so Madre de Dios you can see in this in the southeast corner I don't know can you see my mouse or not you can, cool. Yes, yes, we can see it. Great, so I, okay, good, that's helpful. So Madre Dios is down here, that's my study sites down here. Um, and you can see they, they recently connected what's called the Interoceanic Highway between Peru and Brazil. It's the first time ever that those countries have been connected by land, um, which is really, I mean, great. I mean, I guess good for them economically in the short term, really bad for forest intactness. So. You can see that there's a lot of deforestation up here in Ugiali and San Martin, which is um, up in here, um, and, it, and in MDD, especially where, where once when roads expand, they, they really clear stuff out. And so in the Amazon, it's quite a bit different from North America because those, these systems aren't used to those sorts of land use changes. So in, in the States, um, you know, in the Northeast, in the West, in Florida, the, the species are maybe a little less in Florida, but are used to fragmentation, right? So when habitats are broken up, when there's, because we have fires that happen naturally, we have um, big storms that happen naturally, we have winters, um, again, not as much in Florida, but in a lot of the US glaciation events. So birds are, are equipped to move around. Pretty much everything is nimble in North America um, because it's really elastic year to year and the weather is, is highly variable, but it's not like that in South America because it's so, it's basically on the equator. Um, the temperature is the same all year. So the it, little niche habitats, like one little belt on a mountain, would just have been like that for millions of years. So species have evolved for really, 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 really specific niches. So you see in a lot of the Amazon, a lot of times there will be a little river that you can see across easily. And on either side of the river are completely different species because they can't fly across it. They, a lot of them can only fly like 30, 40 meters. Um, they've done some studies where they take little birds out in a boat um, and release them from land and see how far they can make it. Uh, they, they pick them up from the water. And most of them cannot, like they can only go 20, 30 meters because they're used to just jumping between branches. So when you have this kind of deforestation, the effects are potentially really severe um, because it, it basically is artificially creating those biogeographic barriers and birds even if it looks like a small little road, sometimes they can fly across. And so it creates all kinds of cascading impacts. And the goal of this project was to find out what some of those may be, um, find out better ways to monitor that, et cetera. 
So <laughs> bird monitoring in the Amazon is really hard. Um, it's yeah, unbelievably hard actually. It's like exponentially harder than anywhere else. Um, there's many rare sp species, I lost the percent sign on there, but over 80% of all species are, are rare there, which is, if you can think about what that means, is really challenging. Um, you know, in Florida, like, or anywhere in North America, it's it's kind of the opposite, where most of the species are fairly common, and there's kind of a, a shorter tail of rare species. In the Amazon, you have a few really common species, and then a really long tail, tail of rare species, species with really big ranges, species with really low population density and small specific ranges. Um, and so it makes it really challenging to learn the birds there because so many species are rare that you can't really get field experience with them. So there will be, you know, 40 species that you know really well, and then everything else is just like you see it once in a five month period. Um, and then every time you go birding, you kind of see, like you can walk the same trail every day and there are just different birds on it every time, um, which is, really crazy and very different from North America. Um, the terrain and conditions are really hard. It's super dense forest. The tree canopies are, you know, upwards of 30 meters. So over hundred feet, um, which is really tall. So you can't, you can barely even see in the top of the trees, um, really stratified based on where the birds are. Can't see very far at all. Um, over 90%, over 95% actually of detections are by ear. Um, which again is challenging because the number of species, the number of similar species. I mean, there's there's over 100 flycatcher species, for example, um, just in Madre de Dios. There are 22 species of wood creeper, and they all kind of look the same, and they all kind of sound the same. So, and each of them make like seven noises. So, really hard. <laughs> uh, so, what that means is that for normal surveys, it really magnifies a lot of the challenges with point count. So, differences in observers matter a lot more. Um, if you have a really experienced person and not experienced, it's like completely different, like the numbers of species they'll detect. When I was there at first, I would get like 25 species in the morning, um, trying really hard and get, yeah, I'd have like 22. Um, and then by the end, I mean, I could go for a, a morning hike and hang 160 or more. And like, I have friends that, you know, are at some other sites that are a little more diverse than this one is in it, but that are close, um, because they aren't degraded like this site is. Well, I mean, I, I, had, I had a friend who had three, I think three, 336 or 350 on foot in one day. Like he did a big day on foot at a single site and was in the mid 350s, which is a, it's like the, the I think it's, I think it was a global world record for just w walking. Um, I mean, the highest, the big day record globally is in Ecuador and they used a plane. It's in the mid 400s, but um, yeah, I mean, you can like easily put up a hundred something, 120 species checklist just walking around once you know the sounds, but it's, it takes forever to get to that point. So yeah, I mean, it takes, um, it can take over three months for really high level birders to get to the comfort level that you can reach in a week in essentially anywhere in North America. I mean, at this point I can go pretty much anywhere in North America and tune up in like just a few days. In the Amazon, I mean, three months in was still getting um, a butt kicked. So it's really hard. <laughs> um, and then also there's really high temporal variation. So a lot of species meaning th across time. So some species will vocalize literally in like a three minute window at like 5.07 AM. And they just, they vocally call like twice and that's it for the whole day. And then other species will start later. Like canopy species tend to start later in the day. Um, forest falcons, for example, are pre-dawn. And it really, so if you're doing a survey depending on exactly when you're there, it's a different mix of species. And so you can imagine how it starts getting really tough to get good data because you need to go to the same sites, but it also has to be the same time of day. And it also has to be the same observer and et cetera, et cetera. So all of a sudden it starts kind of tail spinning and there's strong evidence that a lot of the traditional survey data, unlike CBCs, unlike breeding bird counts in North America are really just completely full of errors. Um, to the point where some of them are almost useless just because there's so much variance and so many problems with that. And also it's really expensive and hard to get around because it's the Amazon and it's completely undeveloped. So here's some examples of habitat in Amazonas. Um, oops, you can see like, this is, I guess this is wicked pixelated, but this is a Mauritia palm swamp in the bottom left, um, like flooded forest that has palms, super totally different mix of species. This is a river island, Isla Los Monos, which is um, 
right next to where the study site is. Again, totally different mix of species. You have uh, what are called heliconia and um, a couple different kinds of plants. Also tree diversity is crazy. There's like, I got a lot of, there's, there's like 600 species at single two square mile sites um, of trees. And a single tree in this reserve has more ant species on it, not counting canopy ants, just in the, on the trunk than the entire British Isles. So a single tree has more insect diversity than like all of the UK in, the, in, in this region. Um, this is an oxbow lake of photo I took at Lago Sandoval where they have a bunch of piranhas. Um, again, totally different mix of species, almost no overlap with the, um, some of these other ones. And then this is bamboo forest, which is another specialty habitat that again, has a completely different mix of species that, yeah. And they're really spiky, the Guadua bamboo. Um, so this is, these are two of the sites. Um, basically the, the premise of this study is that understanding that variance and how hard it is, we sort of need new alternative approaches for monitoring the Amazon. There's just not a good way to do it with people standing there. Um, we need something to control for that stuff. And so the idea I had, um, having birded there a lot, my impression was always that in the, in the forest interior, so in North America, the highest, or like really anywhere temperate, the highest alpha diversity or like the most species are in what is called edge habitat. So like you guys, you guys would, would know this, right? Like between where it's forest and then there's a lake next to it or where there's a marsh or grassland next to shrubs, right? Where it's a transition between habitats is where it's best birded because you have a mix and you get more species there. Um, whereas the middle of the forest, if you go into like hardwood, hardwood hammocks, um, like, yeah, there's red cockade, there can be red cockaded woodpeckers or Bachman sparrow um, or what have you, but it's really only a couple of species. Then there's hairy woodpeckers, there's cardinals, right? But that the total number of species is much lower in those interior forest sites than in the more mixed habitats like Lake Avopka or any of that. So in the Amazon, it's really different where the highest diversity is at, is in the deepest interior forest and then as you get to the edge, it declines precipitously. Um, and then, so the transition habitats are actually really bad sometimes, but because you can see further, because the forest is more open there, um, you can see flyovers better, you can see better distance, you can hear better. And it's just generally easier to bird because as you can see, like in the right, it's really dense. I mean, you can see like 10 feet sometimes. So when you have human observers doing point counts, it'll artificially inflate the diversity in those edge habitats because you can see further. So it makes it look like it's not that bad or that in many cases that it's better because that's how you bird it, right? You get into a big open area where you can see into the canopy. Um, and that's the only way you can see up there because if you're standing right underneath it or you're in the dense forest or you're inside a bush and there's no chance. So for, bir for birders, that makes sense. Um, but it's not really reflective of what birds are actually doing. And so if we want to understand the effects of climate change and of deforestation and fragmentation and all those effects on the forest and on communities there, we need to find a way to control for that more effectively. Um, so the idea was if we just used recorders, these are called swift recorders and strapped them to trees. So there was totally visual blind um, and then recorded simultaneously an array across, let me see if I have this map um, like this, that in, in theory you could control, you could record all at the same time. So you could look at one hour at every site at the same time. So then any weather effects, any time of day effects, all that stuff is totally controlled for, not possible with human observers. You could have the same person do all the annotations for all of it so that there's no individual observer bias. And you can, re you can record, you can play back recordings, you can send them to people, you can do all that stuff after you're in the field, which isn't possible with point counts. I mean, so overwhelming that if you're there and something calls, you don't know what it is, it's just gone, right? There's no, nothing you can do about it. So the idea was that using recorders like that would show a stronger edge effect, meaning that it would show that, it should show that alpha diversity is lower on the edge um, if you're only using sound with no visual component. So that was the idea, um, you can see here. So we, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that, let me see. Yeah. So. There's a, there are a bunch of other advantages with it too. Um, like I said, it accounts for the main issues with point counts or at least most of them. 
Um, the standardization up, up differences are huge, especially with weather, temporal, day-to-day -day effects within the same time of day. Um, don't have to worry about any of that. Or you can prove how severe those effects are, which is useful for point counts because we don't have good black and white numbers about how much that variance can be. Um, people estimate it, but there's no way to know. Um, and then permanent data storage. So it works as biological time capsules. So when these systems, these systems are unfortunately in pretty severe decline, even in really intact forest, um, likely because of climate change, we're seeing even in really remote areas, um, species richness declines and extirpation. So it's, it's not going well, um, which is really unfortunate. Uh, and then also because of deforestation, there's rapid change. So in a fragment like the site that where I was, um, we expect to see species disappearing in coming decades as land use pressure intensifies and as species basically run out of genetic diversity because of a increasingly small habitat. So we could actually pinpoint exactly when that happens with long-term things. And also if these systems change really rapidly um, or collapse or any of that, we're gonna have all this data that we can go back and look at and go through. Um, I collected about 4,000 hours of data, 2.2 uh, .2 terabytes in like three weeks, um, just by myself, Cornell has sent me down with no university support. So I got to, um, which is an unbelievable amount of data. Um, it has multi-tax apl applications because not only are birds in there, but there's monkeys, there's insects, there's really audible um, frogs, bats, everything's in there. Um, you can hear big cats. We heard on some of them chainsaws in a reserve um, at pre-dawn, which is not supposed to be there. So there's all kinds of implications with that. You could track when people are hunting, you could you know, be able to get data on insect biomass changes or, or climate effects or any of that. Um, it's all in there, which is completely unique uh, to this sort of method because Camera traps that just catch large mammals. You know, there's no way to do frogs with a camera trap that's that's toned for, um, for jaguars or whatever. And then with insects, there, there's insect noise, so you can do all that. You can do bats, everything. So it's in theory, you could just have everything, basically metadata on the whole Amazon, um, or the whole world, really. And then also there's the potential for automated ID. So that's something I've been working on with this using. I don't know if you you, you all have used Merlin at all. Um, where it's like the AI. So in theory, we could do that with soundscape. It's really hard, but we could do it with soundscapes. You see the, the like, you know, on a spectrogram, like the shapes of sounds. In theory, you could have something do that automated and you could have them do it automated for insect species, for frogs, for everything on, on earth. So then you wouldn't even have to have humans manually annotating it. You could just change the cards and battery once a month and then have like huge amounts of extremely detailed data over the whole world of how everything is reacting, of how human noise is changing, of how bugs are changing, of how frog, everything. So um, it's possible, it's really hard. Um, the data, the technology probably exists with Google or Facebook or when we're working with them, um, but it's really hard to convince people that this makes sense to do now because the automated ID isn't ready. And so you have to do it manually. And a lot of people don't wanna put in the work for that. Um, there's an impression that it's inefficient or that it's just too much or that it's too cutting edge or that point counts work, um, which they do in North America. But um, what I wanna do was not listen to that and just basically do what, what, we, what we're gonna need in 15 years, right? Like what are the steps for what, what, what kind of technology we need in 15 years to make it? Um, Work. And it's also, I mean, it's not good for everything the hummingbirds, swallows, soaring raptors, right? But most of that stuff um, isn't really, you would exclude it from point counts anyways, because species that are flyovers are not, they're just flying over. They aren't tied to the habitat that you're standing in. So the biggest advantages of point counts over ARUs aren't even really useful for from a data perspective. So, okay. Yeah. So this is just when we were picking the different how we're gonna arrange it. We ended up going with this green one um, just to go across the whole reserve, keep a minimum distance so there's not overlapping sound, you know, away from the river so that the river, cause there's boats on it and gold miners. Um, and then you can see this is like a little field station. This is a hotel. Um, and so we put them out there. We thought that we'd be able to 
get around, I say that it optimized for accessibility, but it ended up being really, it was like flooded and every single day it looked different because the water levels kept changing and we kept getting lost and like, um, we had to use a machete. It was way more chrome than we thought. So it ended up not being accessible at all. It took us like six hours to get in there. Um, so this is where the site is. You can see this is Peru, Madre de Dios. And then you can see sort of, depending on how big your screen is, how this is really dark, intact forest everywhere. And around here is the town, city of Puerto Maldonado. And this light green is deforestation. So that's where the road is. On both of these, you can see it. And you can see how it's spreading out. And this site, unfortunately, is right on the edge of that deforestation frontier. So it's right between, this is just intact, like completely untouched forest. There's, I mean, there's uncontacted tribes there. Like I know people who went up some of these rivers up in here and had spears landed in their boat or arrows shot at them. I mean, real uncontacted, like pre-Columbian groups um, that are right there. Like people that have never been in contact with Western civilization and were there before um, Europeans landed in the Americas and just never left. Um, or groups that, you know, were in cities and then because of disease and or a particularly disease, a lot of them reverted to a nomadic hunter-gatherer state um, because it was the only way to survive. And most of those groups that are still there, um, at least in this part, are really aggressive because the ones that aren't aggressive were either assimilated um, into like Western society or, or were wiped out. So the only ones that are still uncontacted for the most part are really aggressive or anti. So you have to be kind of careful. So um, this is, you can see the little green. So then here's the site and you can see there's been really rapid land use change here. So this is an illegal um, road that's unmarked. It's been widened significantly, um, which allows people to come in. Then you can see this is only three year period, um, a ton of clearing around the site. I mean, I had experiences down there where um, up in here where I was looking for a certain forest type and I'd be walking looking at the, the satellite map and then all of a sudden just be standing in a charred field. Um, and you look to the left and you can see all the way to Puerto Maldonado and to the right it's just a wall of trees that goes all the way to the Atlantic. So pretty unbelievable to be on the edge of it there. Um, and this site is a really interesting experiment to see what happens when this sort of artificial fragmentation comes and this site is slowly being cut off from the rest of the Amazon. Um, to see what kind of effect that has on diversity and pretty unfortunate for the people here. So these are the placements you can see they go across. So I might talk about sites. This is site one, which is the edge site. Site 10 is degraded forest. Um, the rest of this is in what's called Barzea, which is like floodplain forest, but it's more mature and big trees and all that. Um, and then a couple of these are mixed sites where it's like a little bit of palm swamp or like kind of flooded forest, like two um, and like five. Um, but most of these are, are not like that. They're big. So, um, yeah, so here just pictures from setting, doing all this stuff, I had them shipped to Colorado. Um, and I got to organize them all down there in the Amazon, put the points out, put the batteries in, had all the cards, um, which was pretty fun. I was a junior in college. It was kind of crazy that I got to do that. Um, here's just some pictures. You can see this is like what we were going through, uh, really gnarly. Um, you can see why we kept getting lost because you just can't see anything. Uh, this is Noe who lives down there and helped me set them up. Um, there I am with my machete and like, this is the edge one that we had to cover up and hide because it's near, like people would probably steal it because it's near where the chainsaws are and where um, there's active encroachment and illegal logging that happens within the reserve. So, but this, you know, all told, like we only have to go out to these sites a couple times, right? You just go out, set them up, check on them a couple times and pick them up. You don't have to go every single morning at pre-dawn like you would for point counts. Um, oops. So this is what the sound files look like when I finally got them in. Um, this is on the wrong side of my screen. The, yeah, so this is one minute of sound uh, from, from one of these recorders. Um, this is after I fully annotated it. So like labeling every single sound to species. Um, it took me about a year. It was 200, I, I did, 21 hours of dawn out of over 4,000 collected. So um, took seven sites, picked three days, did the same dawn hour. Um, maybe shouldn't have done the dawn hour. It was kind of a lot um, at, at seven of those sites. So on the 16th, 20th and 31st of January to see um, how much stuff changed by day. Um, and then also just, yeah, to compare the, the different sites. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing with it is that 
there's so many annotations that the sample size gets pretty good. So I didn't include any p-values in any of that sciencey stuff in this presentation, but they're in the paper. Um, and they were really good. I mean, like, like scientific notation p-values, which is crazy um, because there's just, I mean, I had over 20,000 individual bounding boxes drawn, um, which yeah, it took me over 200 hours of like total time just in Raven doing it. Um, and it was, yeah, it was bad. But, but like now we have a really good fully annotated data set that can be used for training AI algorithms. It can be, um, it just kind of is a good starting point because no one's really ever done that before. Um, people are really intimidated by it for, for good reason I learned. Or I knew this is just like what one of my spreadsheets looked like where I was like taking notes on each one and putting, you know, which days had rain. When I was there, it was the wet season. That's just, yeah, what it looks like. Um, where it was, yeah, I mean, it rained so much. It was, it was, I think, four times the normal rainiest month in Seattle um, in one month. So we had like 200, it was absolutely absurd. Like I got my shirt wet one day and I hung it up inside and came back a week later and it was still wet. And like, there were like mushrooms growing on my hat and like that I put somewhere. It was really absurd. I mean, 100% humidity every day. Um, my camera lens got completely wrecked. Like I got mold in the inside of it, like just not even in the rain, like just cause of the humidity. Um, so I have better precautions with that, but uh, it was really intense. I mean, it was like at war with the elements. So I took all those, these sounds as I found them um, and put them in like a big spreadsheet kind of guide to help make it more consistent in the annotation process. Um, you can see I had to, like there's four letter codes here. There aren't in the Amazon cause there's too many species to so know in standard them. So I had to like, make my own codes and um, and then just yeah put them in here and then slowly was able to assemble a, a good thing this is what the data looks like you can see it like has a bunch of stuff so yeah so i was able to put that all together and um yeah so this is how they performed i compared them to all the ebird data collected from the reserve which i mean it's a little biased because a lot of the ebird checklist volume is me uh, but there are quite a bit of other people who go down there. So um, I took like all 253 checklists from about eight years uh, that were submitted there and compared them to just three days of annotations. And you can see performance was really good for those understory and midstory forest species. I mean, particularly expected species. So over 5% of eBird checklists um, wasn't expecting to get rare stuff in just three days. I mean, I was up in the mid nineties. Uh, I had, I finally got it down to where it was 94.8% of all boxes were identified to species or a broader taxa group. Like sometimes I'd just say pigeon, dove, spa, because I couldn't tell them apart consistently and didn't really, like it just didn't make sense to do that. Um, so really, it, I did really good with the mid-story under species, which are the biggest priority uh, because those are the ones that are most sensitive to land use change. They're the ones that are most likely to decline because of climate stuff. And they're the ones that are hardest to survey with traditional methods. So that was the main goal. And fortunately we did really well with those um, skull. It's like, just imagine if there were like 70 species of Kentucky or no, if there were like 130 species of Kentucky warbler that were even more skulking than that. Um, that's basically what it's like. So, and they only make the call note, that's the song. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, you look at, think of fall warblers and then imagine if there were like 120 and they all behave like Kentucky warbler. So to be able to get 93% of that was really good. Uh, it showed how strong they are. Another benefit of ARUs is that you don't need an observer in the field, which can bias results because birds will be scared or they won't call. I don't know if you've ever sat in the woods or at any place and eventually the birds kind of come back in when they forget that you're there or you, you no longer scare them. But when you just have recorders, there's no disturbance at all. So there's, you don't have to worry about any of that and it makes much cleaner data. Um, with the canopy did not do as well for a couple of reasons. One is that the canopy is super high and I had the recorders at chest height. We could put recorders up in the canopy. We just didn't for this study because it was too much. Um, but in the future you could. The other reason is because they're like impossible to identify. Um, they're just like, they make a bunch of really high, like squeaky noises. It's like the flight calls of warblers, not even the, the chip note, like the sound that that like seat noise they'd make when they take off. It's like that. And so a lot of those species, um, 
Paranga tanager is paradise tanager. I should have included some pictures of them. They're really gorgeous. Like the super gaudy birds that you think of, or when you think of South America probably, or that you see on Facebook. Um, those, they make a lot of really similar calls. So there was just no, like, no one really knows the sounds. And I even sent them to like, I had like John Fitzpatrick helping with it and Ken Rosenberg and some of those real expert guys. And they, they would be like, yeah, we don't know those either. Because when you hear those sounds, you just look up and then go through the flock visually. But I couldn't do that because it was just recordings. So um, then I did super bad with like nocturnal species, swifts, hummingbirds, soaring raptors, aquatic species. Some of this is just because of where I put them like um, like aquatic species and nocturnal from when I, I didn't really do night. So I just got a couple of them um, that were still calling right at the beginning of that dawn hour. And then the aerial insectivores and stuff, I didn't even, like it wasn't the target, but you could just do a hawk watch. Um, so that's not that, that much of a, a problem. So um, I used, I came up with this metric called vocal prevalence, which basically what it was is like using, um, this is where it's kind of science, you know, try to distill it, where you take the whole hour and you split it into 15 second intervals. And then if a species is a foreground vocalization, so not really quiet, um, or like barely an audible, like a background one, then that's like just a value of one. So basically what it does is it gives you, if you were to stand there for one minute, like what, or for 15 seconds, the chance that that bird is going to vocalize during that 15 second period. So it's like a very general measure of like of, of call of species activity levels. Um, call rate, people would be like, well, what about just counting the calls? But it doesn't really work because species are, they call at different rates and they have different gaps between vocalizations. So when I'm drawing the boxes, we had to pick a standard time period to cut off the box because some birds might sing three seconds apart and then some sing six seconds apart. And is that one box or two? So we just had it as five seconds, which is the standard thing, um, which, but it, what it means is that a species that sings six seconds apart instead of three, it'll make it look like there's like a hundred calls for that one and like three calls for the other one, even though it's singing the whole time. And you can't use total annotation length because then it'll just tell you that, you know, the one that has a three second thing was singing for like 30 minutes continuously, which is also not true. So vocal prevalence is a good in between. It kind of smoothed out that. Um, and so I wanted to see how well it correlated with species richness and Shannon diversity, which is a metric, but species richness is just the number of, of species on a recording. Um, yeah, so like the species count on eBird checklist is, is the species richness. Um, because vocal prevalence doesn't require IDs at the species level. So if you just know it's a pigeon, you don't know what kind it is, or just know it's a flycatcher, you just draw the same box and it doesn't matter because it's a sum value. Um, and you don't have to ID it to species. You can just say it's like one of these four, you know, and, and it makes it a lot easier um, to get accurate data because you don't have to, you don't have to be able to separate all the embeds or all the warblers by call. You can just say warbler call, warbler call, and that it does the same thing. So what you can see here is that it correlated really strongly. I mean, this is, this is pretty, I don't know if you guys know like science numbers, but pretty crazy. I mean, you can see it's a really tight correlation, um, which was really surprising because you'd think that, you know, if grackles or whatever are making more noise, that doesn't, that shouldn't in theory, or like people wouldn't think that it would um, be correlated with how many species are present, but found that it actually really was which is good because if you didn't have time or expertise to get species richness, you could just do vocal prevalence and it's a, a suitable substitute based on our data. Um, the other thing that really, really, really stood out here, as you can see the colors um, are which day it was, there's extreme clustering by day, which was, which was a huge surprise. Uh, we expected there to be variance between days, but I didn't expect it to be anything near this consistent. Um, especially because these days were really close to each other. I mean, day, this was this, yeah, the 20th, the 16th, and the 31st. They were all days with no rain, pretty much the same temperature. Um, I haven't even looked at the weather for it because it's not the, the purpose of the study. It was probably weather, but it might be there was some insect hatch, it might be there was more mixed flock activity. I mean, obviously some birding days are better than others, but we didn't expect it to be this consistent at every site. Um, the vocal prevalence, on at every single all every single site was highest on day B and lowest on day C, which was pretty unbelievable. There was no overlap at all. They had the same order every single site. It was B then A then C. 
even two miles apart. So what that means is that if you were to do traditional methods and people, you know, some studies have said, well, you need to go to each site four times, once really early, once later in the morning, right, to account for that. But when it's like this, um, it means that between days, you know, if you went to the edge site on the good day, then the interior site that's supposed to have more species on a bad day, then it would make the edge site, it's actually a bigger difference between days than between sites, even when the differences between sites are statistically significant. So not only does it hide those differences, but it can give you the complete wrong conclusion, depending on what day you were there. And we don't even really know what causes that. And no one had really done that because no one's used simultaneous monitoring and you couldn't prove it if you were just doing one site at a time. But because we have the same hour at all three, seven sites at the same time, I mean, you would hear a gust of wind and it's the same on all seven recordings, you know, or there would be a little bit of a rain shower, same on all seven recordings. So it doesn't affect the differences between them. Um, so that was really fascinating, really conf like confusing. And you can see also, well, the habitat things, the Varzeo is best. Um, then the like the fringe habitat, so the degraded and edge was was worse for those two. Um, so <laughs> sorry, it's kind of it's it's a lot. So basically, well, another thing that I did is I got some uh, looked at some traditional avian censuses from Coach Kashu, which is also in Madre de Dios um, from the '90s with Ted Parker. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. Like, um, basically the best birder ever, uh, Scott Robinson, who's a uh, University of Florida right now, um, and another really well-known neotropical ornithologist, John Turbaugh, uh, is just basically the best, some of the best birders ever. And they were there for, they put in 12 man months of effort. It was, you know, they were there for months, misnetting point counts, really, 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 really intensive surveying. Um, and so I wanted to see with that amount of effort, if like one random undergrad could get kind of similar results because I'm controlling for that stuff. Um, but they weren't able to, so they had to do way more days. So I went ahead and tossed my um, stuff in. They did a rank order curve, which is basically to show um, this is using abundance. So number of individuals per 100 hectares or whatever. So it shows you can see that there's a few species that are really common and then a really long tail of, of rare ones, like I was describing earlier. Um, and it fits like a log distribution for whatever. So mine was almost exactly the same. So it got the same community composition. You can see this is out of 250 species. Mine's out of 125. I had 134 total um, on those three days at this one place, but really unbelievable to be able to get the same thing because you could just model, you could just project how much more that would go if you were to keep going. Because most of the species I had were only at one or two days or one or two recordings, which means that if I just kept doing more recordings, that line would keep going longer. Um, so that was pretty unbelievable. It means that you could just, you could replicate what took them so long to get quickly, um, which is a big advantage. Um, this is the temporal one. I, you don't have to, I know it, this is just from the paper, but um, this is a sun bittern too, which is a really crazy bird uh, down there. Uh, yeah, so you can see like day B was crazy. Like the mean is like 957, 33, um, for species richness and it drops all the way to 26. So that's a pretty big difference, 33 to 26 species, just like three days apart. Um, and these aren't migrants or anything, they're just present birds. It wasn't during migrate, it was just in January. Um, and then vocal prevalence here, even more. I mean, 576, 537 to 956, almost double. I mean, approaching double, which again, unbelievable, did not expect that. Um, and you can see that the lowest on day B was seven, um, 794, which is well above the highest on day C. So even the best sites on the worst day were lower than the worst sites on the best day. Um, you can see here too, lowest site on every single day was that edge or degraded site. And the best ones were always those intact forest sites. So again, really consistent, was not supposed to be that consistent, but it was. Um, and then this is, I know it's a lot of numbers, but same thing here, um, except for locations. You can see this is the percent unidentified, which I was pretty happy with. I can't believe I got them this low. Um, and then you like, again here, like these, these Varzea sites are higher um, and then it starts going down. And again here, the best day, uniformly day B, um, a couple, it was A, but slightly. And then uniformly day C or maybe day A. 
Um, so again, you're pretty incredible. Um, these sites are down 43, 42. They go from, yeah, they like this is the total number that was recorded there. Um, so again, a big difference, 52, 42 to 55 species. Um, and the range is, is really impressive too. Like this was 18 on two of the days um, and then 32 on day B. Like it jumped from 18 to 32 on that one day, which was amazing. And then same with, with, day, with site B too, which it was 28 on the two days and then it jumped to 41. So from 28 to 41 and then from 18 to 32, just because of four days apart, which was unbelievable. And also because those sites were close to each other, I think what it was with those two sites that had a really extreme spike, um, there was a huge mixed flock that just went between both of them. Um, but because I had simultaneous recording, I could actually prove that it was the same birds um, and control for it. So this shows, um, this is an American pygmy to king fisher, which is like this big really little they make this little squeak noise like really like this big like they're tiny um this is it shows the the this is whatever science stuff but basically what it means is that the difference from site one in like community composition so like what species were there between that and interior sites was consistently way higher um than all those other sites against each other so it shows that it like all those interior sites were basically homogenous with each other. They didn't, um, they didn't have significant differences. Uh, the differences between days mattered more, but site one was really different. So one potential explanation for that is that when a site is degraded species, it's called um, re like reduction homogenization, which is where like 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 the kind of really finicky species like Bachman sparrow right are disappear. So then the differences between really high quality pine forest and not as high quality pine forest or red cockaded woodpecker, right? If those species are not present, then the habitat quality differences don't matter that much because the only ones that are responsive to the really high quality habitat are already extirpated um, and you need to reintroduce them. But here, and then, yeah, and then like hairy woodpecker is just gonna be in whatever. So it doesn't really matter, you know, marginal difference doesn't make that much. But here, what it shows is that, yeah, there's probably been some loss of some really specific interior forest species. And so it becomes more similar. And so only that edge site was different. Um, so the Quetzal picture I took. So here with, I did soundscape representation, which is another different metric that no one's done that I just kind of thought about and then did um, where I took like the percent share. So I split species up into groups based on their habitat preference. So I took um, interior like primary forest specialists. So like Bachman sparrow, red cockaded woodpecker um, or a bunch of warblers on the breeding ground, um, which is most of the species there. Edge secondary forest. So ones that like kind of degraded habitats or, you know, like like grackles or crows or, um, or, or house sparrows, right? Which would, wouldn't be in the middle of the forest. They'd just be on the outside. And then generalists um, like crows or like downy woodpeckers or flickers, which will just kind of be wherever. They could be in the middle of the forest, they could be way on the outside. So what you'd expect, and this is another thing, try, or I was trying to imitate really high effort studies with just one person to see like if you could do the same thing. So they do like per capita song rate, which is where, you know, the amount that a bird sings is correlated with how qual high quality the habitat is. So in really good habitat, birds will sing more frequently because um, for a couple of reasons. One is that they want to advertise more because it's better. And then the other one is because when it's better habitat, there's more other species, I mean, more other individuals in higher density. So there's more competition. So they have more reason to sing to try to keep birds away. You see that in North America, pretty much everywhere in the world, um, song rates are higher by individuals. Um, but to get per capita song rate, it's really high effort. I mean, you got to like watch the bird and see how many times one individual is singing or you have to look at the recordings and like identify which individuals, you know, like slight differences in the song between different individuals and try to estimate how many different ones are. And it's really high effort. You can't do it for 130 species. You can do it for eight species or 20, but no way you can you do it for all of it. So I thought, well, you could kind of approximate that by just getting the percent share of vocal prevalence. So like made up of those groups. So like how much of the total sound basically is made up by generalist, secondary specialist, and primary specialist. And then the percent share of species richness. 
So what percentage of the species that have been recorded there are belonging to those three groups? And then seeing the difference. So if there's, you know, 15% of the species are generalists, but they're making up 30% of the call volume, then those species are way more hyped to be in that habitat. And there's probably more of them. They're probably in better quality habitat. They're probably performing better and breeding better. Um, whereas if a species makes a group makes up 20%, but they're only 10% of call volume, they're all being kind of quiet, probably aren't that many of them probably aren't doing that well, um, probably aren't trying to be there for much longer. Um, and also when a bunch of birds are singing more birds like them come in to that habitat. So you get an even more effect of that. So what you'd expect is that in the Varzea in the best forest, that interior specialists would have more song than species richness. And in like the mixed habitat, the generalists would have more and maybe in the fringe habitat, but that they'd have less in the interior because ideally interior species would outcompete generalists in the best interior habitat. That's the whole premise, right? Is that generalists can kind of be anywhere, but in any like really high quality habitat, they're gonna be losing out. Um, but we didn't see that. Um, yeah, and they also edge secondary specialists. So it's kind of like this in these where they're kind of braided together. You see a lot of overlap in the confidence intervals, right? So that's what you'd expect. So we saw that with secondary specialists in the mixed forest and in the Varzea. So yes, it's intact forest. There's no grass, there's no clearings. Um, and so they were a low share of species richness, about 10, 20%, 10, 20%, um, and a low species of call volume. And they, they totally overlapped, but in the fringe habitat, that gap widened where they're making a lot more sound um, than they are a share of species richness. So you can see this is site one, that edge one, I know they're really small labels, but that's what you'd expect. This is normal. Um, but we saw that interior specialists expected to be below here, right? You'd expect them to be a really low share of vocal prevalence. See almost, I mean, like 3%, it was under 10%, um, even though they were 20, about 25% of species richness they were only five percent of call volume so they're just they're just you you know one might go in there but they don't like that habitat at all and um there might be yeah one bird that's there but not good population things in the mixed habitat it gets better you see it starting to tighten up a little bit because it's a little more like their habitat and then in the varzea it gets quite close but even in the varzea they were still underrepresented they still they never crossed the line so even the most intact, the center of the reserve, you know, a, a kilometer away from the edge. And people will say, okay, 50 feet from the edge, that makes sense, there'd still be effects, 100 yards, sure. But I'm looking, I mean, a kilometer in, like the middle of this reserve where the forest looks beautiful, totally untouched, it's never been logged, it's a pristine biodiversity reserve, and still the primary specialists are getting outcompeted, which is, was really like a, a shocking result, um, sort of expected but not totally. And then here, generalists too, where in the fringe habitat, they're about proportional, about equal, which makes sense because that's kind of in the middle. In the mixed habitat, like I said, really outcompete, like way higher share of call volume. You can see it's, I mean, it's 70, over 70% 70 of call volume, even though they're only 40% of species richness. So really dominant in the soundscape of the mixed habitats. And, but then in the Varzea, the highest quality forest, generalists are still outcompeting. So my argument with it is that, look, it doesn't really matter how good the forest looks. It doesn't matter what the plants are. It doesn't matter like if it's never been logged, never, no trails, no people. If generalists are out competing primary specialists, then it's not primary forest, right? Then it's degraded forest. Because if it, if it was primary forest, then primary specialists would be the dominant species there and they aren't. So obviously there's something about that forest that the birds are affected by and see that we don't. And so it doesn't really matter if humans can tell um, what matters is how it's actually used by species. So that's one of the things I'm trying to push with this is that like we need like more like smarter habitat assessments that are kind of reverse engineering it based on let's categorize it based on what the birds see and not us. Cause I, I mean, I went out there and like, you know, there's 600 species of trees. What am I supposed to do? Say this looks pretty good because the trees are big. Like I have no clue, you know, the birds can tell though. And so just using what species are known to be in primary, then you can tell what the habitat's supposed to be. So it has pretty exciting implications actually for like site assessments to see if how intact a reserve is because you could just do this in one day. You can see it's really consistent and you could just do like a day of it 
and then see what the gap is and see how good that habitat is and how intact it is without having to do any vegetation surveys or anything. Just look at the indicator species and see how they're doing. Um, yeah, which again, is not like how people would do it. They'd look at the trees and say, this could have Bachman sparrow. They don't say, well, because there's Bachman sparrows that makes it high quality, you know, that's not normal. Um, so the impl implications of it, the collared puff bird and a gilded barbet, which means it's like, rah, 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 not funny nine. They're like, they're little, but um, is that, so the temporal variation was way more than expected. Not only was it more than expected, but it was insanely consistent. So that means, I mean, it, it's kind of a problem for point counts, honestly, because it means that like you would need, you would need an insane number because then it changes by season too. So you wouldn't have to have like the same person like teleporting basically between sites. Um, I don't even know, like, I don't even know how you could do that because, you know, it takes forever to get between them. Even if it takes five minutes, it still changes the, whatever. So it's a mess with that. Um, and then like, it, so there are advantages. The, the main thing was that there's reason to just do it now, even though it seems inefficient, even though I only did three days, I was still able to get way cleaner data than you could get from point counts because you, you need so much less because everything else is controlled for. So you don't need a huge sample size of days. Um, plus, once that automated stuff goes, my data is not gone. We can just run it through um, 20 years from now when you're able to do that and it'll all be on there. Um, but yeah, some of those metrics worked really well. Um, and it's pretty exciting because for climate stuff, we need better tools. I mean, we know that deforestation in the Amazon is leading to climate instability. It's reducing agricultural yields. It's doing a lot of really horrible stuff for the planet. Um, but before we can like say in black and white terms exactly how much change is happening, like when you draw the road like this, you lose this many species exactly. And here's how long it takes for them to go away. And here's the effect on seed dispersal. And here's the effect on agricultural productivity. Um, until we can do that, it's really hard to make strong arguments to governments, to agricultural you know, corporations, right? Um, you just can't really, it's not coherent. You can just say, well, we know it's bad when you cut down the trees, but they need to see the details. So this gives us the chance to do that. And it also shows that we basically can't get there with point counts. We need new methods. Um, yeah, and then also like that it's scalable, that it could be cheap to do that for the quality of data you can get. Um, and that's not even considering like the, about the fact that like my data is I think now being used for some bat research and for some cicada research because they were recording 24 seven. So you have nights in there. There's a bunch of bats. I saw them. So I just sent them to some bat people. It's like, you guys want like 4,000 hours of pristine night recordings from the Amazon and a deforestation gradient. And they're like, okay. So they can just look and they can do, I mean, it's all in there. So um, pretty unbelievable. There's probably jaguars. Um, yeah. So I have some like random pictures of like other fauna that's down there. Um, we caught a stingray one day. You can see in Bolivia, um, pretty scary actually. Like we had to get it out of the boat with an oar. There's stingrays in Bolivia. It's like 3,000 miles from the ocean. Um, is it a capybara, huge thing. These like turtle dudes that are around, they're really big, these tortoises. Um, I would just go on the boat with all these, like there were indigenous people that were down there because I was the only person from the US. So nobody spoke English or anything. So I was just out there on the boat with them and they would pull in the craziest stuff because it's also the peak for fish diversity globally. So there's like 340 species of fish or something. So they would just, every time it was like just insane, um, huge fish and everything. Here's a piranha that I caught. And we ate, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you can like the way it just snaps right through the stick is pretty scary. So yeah, we were eating piranhas. Um, yeah, this is the Rio Madre de Dios. So this is like the site is right there and you have to go everywhere on boat because uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can't like, there's no roads um, except for the illegal ones, but yeah. Wow, Alec, this was amazing. and. I feel like I need to watch this two or three times just to really sort through all the information. This is so amazing. I know everyone's really enjoyed it. Um, Susan has a couple of questions that um, she can ask from the chat. Okay. Um, one question is how healthy are the Amazons? I heard there is a lot of deforestation going on. Um, Amazon meaning like the forest or? Yeah, the I think the forest. Oh yeah, so we've lost about 20% of it. It's honestly pretty bad. It's in a, it's kind of on the edge of a 
Yeah, so it depends on this on how like the standards for bat, I would say. Um, compared to Asia, Asian tropical forest, it's really good. Um, maybe not compared to Papua, but compared to like, I mean, I've been to Southeast Asia and like those forests are wrecked, completely destroyed in almost all of it. Like Thailand, I mean, just insane. Indonesia, just destroyed. Um, the Amazon is the biggest tropical forest ever. Um, well, in like on the earth. Um, the second biggest is the Congo Basin. Amazon's quite a bit larger. Um, and quite a bit more intact. So of tropical forests, it's really the, it's by far the best, by far the most intact. Um, it's about 80% intact. Um, the problem is that because of rapid deforestation that's been going on for decades and continues to accelerate, especially under Jair Bolsonaro, um, about 80% of Amazon deforestation is because of beef. So, um, which is crazy, I mean, 80% because of beef. Uh, in Peru, it's mostly not, it's it's almost entirely subsistence agriculture. So you saw those little burn plots on the map earlier, um, which I can, so the little burn plots are, I'll go back to that, um, are, are just people coming mostly from the Andes. They aren't locals, um, people who are really poor, who don't have good options, um, who just come down because there's no laws. They just cut down a square forest and grow some crops there. And that's what most of it is. And that's why it's so bad along the roads because then it gives people access to the forest and they can just kind of cut little bit by bit. Um, and it causes huge ripple effects. Um, but most of it is beef in Brazil, which is where most of the Amazon is like, yeah, over upwards of 80%. Um, most of the rest of that is soy, uh, mm -hmm. which is primarily used for cattle feed, um, which is pretty unfortunate. I mean, I eat beef and stuff, but it is, it is the driver of that. So yeah, it's not doing particularly well. The, the, the main concern is what's called savannification. So it's when the Amazon, there's a tipping point, which is where it crosses a certain line um, where the forest cannot produce enough moisture to sustain itself. So at that point, the whole system could collapse and basically turn into savanna. So like dry forest um, and like the Sahado in Brazil. So if that happens, I mean, it'll just stabilize the whole planet. Like, yeah, because we think that probably there's been some modeling that loss of the Amazon would lead to, for example, 50% snowfall reductions in the Sierra Nevada, 50% um, snowfall reductions, which feeds the Central Valley, California. It's the main agricultural exporting sector for the entire country. So if that happened, then it would just, it could destabilize the US economy. It could I mean, yeah, so that's why it's so important to get the data there because it's not doing well. And we need to know what it was like five years before right now, right? Because in 10 years, we need to figure out how much has changed. Um, and that's why it's so important to get people out there and get that data right now because um, it's changing really fast. Um, I mean, even between years at EDA, like I was there in 2019 and 2018 and it was different. And talking to people there, they were like, yeah, like, it's just not this. And like, you go to another side on the side of the river and there's species, there's a bunch of species that just aren't present in Inkatera that probably should be. And like, we don't really know why. Um, and then some species that are still there that we're surprised are still there um, and seem to be doing well. So like, that's why it's important because we just really don't have any idea in the kind of detail we need to have. Because um, really subtle changes could, you know, the whole thing could collapse and then you know, it's like the Gulf Stream cooling, um, where it could, it could just, it could basically un unwind the whole spool of yarn um, of the planet. So that's why we're trying to be really aggressive with the system. And that's why I like wanted to do this for my thing, because even though it's way harder and, you know, all that stuff, like the marginal impact of, you know, if we can, if we can stop it from collapsing, like it'll be the single most impactful thing that humans have ever done like by a wide margin um, because it like, we've never had anything even close to this important that was in our hands that like we were at risk of breaking. Um, not like Asia, right? Where it's like, sim it's like near a little peninsula as so the land area is just not enough in Southeast Asia to do that. I mean, a lot of it wasn't good for us anyways, like Indonesia, it's like islands, you know? Amazon is just so much. And like those trees are, I mean, it's made of carbon. So we think probably 40% of all climate change so far is because of land use. 
um, change. So deforestation. So if we were able to fix this and get better leverage and let this stuff reforest, like it could basically, I mean, you could take 40% of climate change back. It would completely slow it down. So, and maybe even like halt it for the most part, because these trees will get bigger now that there's more carbon in the atmosphere. So whatever, sorry, it's a lot. <laughs> I get <laughs> What do you think is the potential of these methods for applied conservation? Any hope of using these tools to gain on the scale and pace of species decline? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely. And like, it's, we're already seeing that. I mean, here, right? Like it's our, like, it was, this is an undergrad thesis, right? Like this isn't like a lab or like a, like a professor, you know, it was just me. Like I was like 20, you know? Um, so the fact that you could get this, high like data to this quality with one person who like I, I didn't even know the birds right like I, I mean I, I've spent quite a bit of time in South America but like not on the level I mean not even compared like you know I'm not from there I like what's seven months like if you were a new birder what's seven months somewhere you know it sounds like a lot but like it's not I mean if you're seven months into just learning birds so like you know when I'm learning all the sounds from scratch and it's it's like it's like basically learning everything you know about North America two times over from scratch. I mean, you know, I'm super imperfect with it. So yes, if we scaled it up, like with people who were even more experienced, who were, had more, yes, it could be absolutely. And it already has been used. Um, for example, in Australia, the night parrot species that um, was presumed extinct. Uh, yeah, it's a nocturnal parrot in the outback they actually were able to refine it and now are finding new things with the use of ARUs um, in Australia. And so that's how they, they just put them all over the place. And then you can have automated detection because the automated stuff does work for certain things like in Australia where it's pretty cool, it's quiet at night because it's not the Amazon where there's a million bugs and everything. Um, and it's just like, there's like a drone in these recordings. It's like really loud. Um, whereas in Australia it works so they can just tune it to hear that one sound and it works. And so we've, we've literally discovered species we thought were extinct already with it. So yes, the potential is there. It's just a matter of people like willing to like go that way and not, you know, and be willing to push the boundary on it. But yes, yeah, absolutely. All right, and Kathy asked, what is the next area of research you plan to do? Is that my mom? Of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, it depends. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of things I'm interested in. I mean, that like the Amazon stuff is critically important. I'm really interested in um, Central Africa too, just because I mean, you talk about people not knowing what's going on in the, like people who have no idea there because people are scared of it. And it's also like the lowland birding is just, it's extremely hard. Like it's the hardest birding in the world by a lot. I mean, it's, it's so hard. It's like, it's like when it's a hundred in Florida at 1 PM, but there's also 600 species and you've never seen any of them. And like they call once and you can't see it. Like, it's like, it's unbelievably hard, actually. Like even Ecuador had a, like I was, I mean, it's it's stunningly different. Like I can't, I can't stress enough how hard it is. Like, um, yeah, I mean, I've heard it all over the world and it's like, it is so much harder than anywhere. Um, so I'm interested in it because like no one's willing to do it. And like the rewards are crazy. Like once you actually start figuring it out, um, cause there's so many species and then it's like, you're getting like first, like one of my friends was in, Central Africa this year and he like just saw this mountain that looked spicy and so he climbed up it and there was a sunbird on top that they had never like just a new species straight up like just so that stuff is there and so yeah I'm really and that and then also Indonesia which is really interesting because they have extremely high like each island is like totally different species and there's absolutely undescribed species there. I don't know, it's one of those three probably, which says nothing because those are the three tropical regions in the whole world. So I, I'll play it by ear, but like there's no shortage of questions that are interesting and like no shortage of, I don't know, anyone who's going into that research, like there's unlimited questions for it because no one really knows what's going on. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, that's fine. We, we really appreciate your time, especially I had no idea that, that you were just graduating and just submitting your, your research. And this is just amazing. And I know uh, those that weren't able to join us will be watching this and you're opening our eyes to all kinds of possibilities and things that we can look forward to. Um, young people like you that are on the Brink of really, really important research. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Thanks, yes, Anna. thank you.
Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, it's cool. I mean, we just kind of, we, there's no reason for us to like restrain ourselves. Like it's not even that expensive to go to a lot of Latin America. So I recommend it to everyone. Like if you can, like try just like, just like go to like Ecuador or something, you know, cause the on the ground expenses are cheap. It's not, it's really not, doesn't have to be more expensive than going to Arizona, oftentimes cheaper. Um, and that's just the start of it. Like Southeast Arizona, South Texas. I mean, that is like, you saw in that one map with the colors, it's like, it just keeps getting better until the equator. And we're like kind of resigning ourselves to the edge of it when like, we don't have to, you can just go there and you know, I don't know, <laughs> I'm a big advocate. All right, well, we got lots of comments that 